Namaste, and welcome back to Spiritual Intelligence. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at a very important principle that will help us to raise our SQ level as we understand and apply this principle in our life. And that is the metaphysical principle of the unity between consciousness and energy, or the law of cause and effect. This understanding of the unity between consciousness and energy is the key to unlocking the power of manifestation and spiritual evolution. So I'm going to be giving you that key in today's video. So please join me for this 17th episode of Spiritual Intelligence as we explore the law of cause and effect. We've already discussed at length in this series that energy represents the feminine principle or Shakti and consciousness represents the masculine principle or Shiva. And these two polarities appear to be separate or distinct from one another from a fourth dimensional level of awareness. But as we move higher into fifth dimensional awareness and above, we begin to realize that these two polarities are absolutely one single phenomenon, one aspect of the Creator's being, not two. And so through this understanding, we can begin to unlock some powerful keys to manifestation and evolution. And as we explore these two components, we're going to begin to see this unity of consciousness and energy crystal clear. So let's look at each one of these two components individually and see what insights they have to offer us, beginning with manifestation. Consciousness and energy can be said to be cause and effect. What we hold in consciousness must eventually manifest in form through energy. Energy is the manifest aspect of the source and consciousness is the unmanifest aspect. So energy is essentially the vibratory correlate of consciousness. It is the extension of consciousness into space-time. This is the law of cause and effect, which some also call the law of reversibility. It says that all causes and effects are one, meaning if A creates B, then B can also create A. Through this law, we can see how energy can create changes in consciousness just like consciousness can create changes in energy. For example, electrical currents can create magnetic fields, but a strong magnetic field will also eventually begin to produce its own electrical currents. Another example of this law is that if you have enough heat, that heat will eventually create light. And likewise, if you have enough light, it will eventually produce heat. So how does this translate to consciousness and energy? When consciousness is in a happy state of being, the body will respond by smiling and laughing. But if you are feeling unhappy, you can create a happier state of being by making the body smile and laugh. This understanding is the key to all manifestation. This is the reason that we always hear, if you want to manifest something, you must be in the wish fulfilled. Or as Jesus put it in Mark 11:24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have already received it and it will be yours. The feeling of fulfillment in consciousness produces a vibratory correlate in energy that goes out into the universe and must eventually create the kind of circumstance which would have caused that state of being. So if we hold an idea in consciousness that produces a certain state of being within us, the energy of the universe must manifest that state of being into a circumstance which matches it. It is impossible that this will not happen unless you cancel out that state of being with doubt, worry, or fear. Because energy and consciousness are one, all we ever have to do in order to manifest a desire is to feel the state of being we would imagine having if that desire was fulfilled. That state of consciousness must produce 
the exact configuration of energy in time space which has the power to cause that state of consciousness. This is the universal law of cause and effect. So when it comes to raising our spiritual intelligence, this is a very important law to understand because it helps us to realize the gravity of staying in a negative state of being for extended periods of time. For example, if you're driving down the highway at 120 miles an hour, you're probably not feeling very relaxed in that moment. Your adrenaline's probably pumping and you're probably feeling a lot of alertness and an inner awareness that's telling you you're violating a law right now. So if a police officer catches you, you're gonna be in big trouble. So you probably don't stay driving 120 for very long before you slow back down, right? Now, for my fellow common law enthusiasts, I know that speed limits aren't real laws, but I'm just using this as a convenient example. When you are violating a universal law that you know is true in your awareness, it compels you to do whatever it takes to raise your consciousness out of that state of being, meaning you'll suddenly become willing to drop any attachment or forget about whatever story it is that's keeping you in that state of being because you know the law of cause and effect is always working and you don't want to attract circumstances that match that state of being. This is how understanding universal laws like the law of cause and effect can drastically raise our SQ level. Once you feel this law operating within you, you can not only use it to avoid creating negative circumstances, but you can begin using it to your advantage. Once you know that cause and effect is a law, just like gravity, then you don't have to believe that your desires will manifest anymore. You simply know that they will. Just like I know if I drop an apple, it's going to fall to the ground. I don't have to believe that it will fall to the ground. But what I can do to cancel out that law, so to speak, is if I then doubt my desires, or I feel unworthy of them, or I feel fearful about them, the law of cause and effect says that energy must manifest that state of consciousness into form as well. So this law can obviously go both ways, right? Just like any universal law. But now that we see how this law can benefit us greatly in manifestation, let's also look at how this law can benefit us in our own spiritual evolution. To understand how the law of cause and effect can benefit our spiritual evolution, we first need to understand what karma is. Now, I like to think about karma as soul energy in motion. Think about our soul as a blueprint of a divine thought form in God's mind, or a logos, if you will, that exists eternally in the divine mind. And these thought forms of God come into incarnations to gradually realize and actualize their eternal divine potential. So through many lifetimes of evolution, the soul gradually ascends back to that perfect blueprint of what the soul actually is. This is what spiritual evolution is, right? So during an incarnation, our souls send out our energy to all kinds of things in the world of form. And this is what causes karma to happen. Anything that our soul has an attachment to or a resistance towards creates a karmic tie with that thing. And so that karmic tie extends our soul's energy out, which then lowers the available energy our soul has. So this energy our souls extend out through karma is never actually separate from us, but we could say it's being borrowed by something else and is therefore unavailable for us to use for our spiritual growth. So the lower the available energy is that the soul has, the lower our level of consciousness is because energy and consciousness are one. This is what the Hawkins map of consciousness essentially shows us, that as our level of consciousness rises, the amount of energy we are producing rises with it. Now, unfortunately, I've learned the hard way that I can't even show you the map of consciousness or Veritas Publishing will rip my YouTube video down and flag my channel. So just imagine in your mind's eye with me, 
the map of consciousness from zero to a thousand, we have states of being like love and peace calibrating at five and six hundred, according to David Hawkins. And so these states of being require a lot of available energy, which is why we can't access these states when we have a lot of karma, because we don't have enough available energy to access them. We've extended our energy out in so many ways karmically. And so our karma will eventually force us through all of the suffering it creates to expand our awareness and try to figure out why we're suffering so much. And eventually we'll realize it's because of all my attachments and all of my resistance towards life that I am suffering. And then our soul begins to take that energy back from those karmic ties and it becomes available for us to use for spiritual ascension. This is the essence of causal purification, which we've talked about in past episodes. It's the third type of purification on the ascension spiral, which we could also conveniently call karmic purification. So it's really helpful to understand that the law of cause and effect works synergistically. Meaning, if I have an attachment to an outcome, that attachment will eventually cause a state of anger or frustration when that outcome gets blocked. And then my state of anger and frustration will manifest more blocked outcomes, which make me more angry, and so on and so forth. If I'm feeling uh, lonely and sad from being single for so long, well, my state of sadness and loneliness will produce more singleness, making me more sad and lonely. So until we learn how to deny our circumstances and instead change our state of being from within, we will always remain in these negative feedback loops of cause and effect, back and forth, back and forth. If you stay stuck in this law of cause and effect feedback loop for long enough, you'll become so miserable and incensed from your suffering that you may just fly to India or Tibet and fall at the feet of a guru and beg for them to set you free from your suffering. And all that the guru will do for you is to give you teachings and practices that will help you to slowly change your state of being from within. Because your state of being creates your reality. And then your reality will either expand it or contract it. So this cycle of cause and effect can work just as effectively on the positive end as it does on the negative end. So let's take another look at how this law operates when it comes to karma and spiritual evolution. You can think of our souls as packets of source energy that are extended out into space and time. And we spend our soul energy through karma, which is any action taken from the belief in separation. The only two ways we can act on separation is attachment or resistance. So in this way, the ego acts as a kind of energy vampire that is constantly taking our soul's energy and extending it outside of us onto objects, desires, and identities. These karmic attachments create unconscious conditioning patterns. And whenever we think or act apart from source, we extend our soul's energy outside of us, which in turn, lowers our state of consciousness. So spiritual evolution is the art of retrieving our soul's energy from all the karmic ties we've created. Until we heal our karmas, we cannot raise our level of consciousness because without energy, consciousness cannot rise. So the question is, if someone doesn't have enough energy to raise their state of consciousness, how could they ever evolve? The answer is, through right action. When we begin to act and behave in ways that are loving and righteous, even if we don't yet feel loving or righteous on the inside, these actions must produce within us their correlating state of consciousness. Just like smiling when you feel sad will actually lift your mood and cause you to feel happier. This is the essence of karma yoga doing good deeds in order to heal our karmic patterns and retrieve our soul energy. If energy and consciousness are one, then they must always mirror one another. When we use our energy 
to act in ways that are in alignment with higher consciousness, it actually produces that state of consciousness within us. Right action is the first limb of the eight limbs of yoga, which is called Yama in Sanskrit. And now we can see why, right? Because what good is it to read all these spiritual books and go to retreats and even practice meditation if you're not at least making some effort to live righteously and spiritually? If we're not attempting to live in accordance with the truth we're reading and learning about, why would studying that truth produce any change in our level of consciousness yet? Your level of consciousness is basically the way that you think and perceive reality. And your energy is the way you act and conduct yourself in that reality. So we must strive to harmonize these two components of self together so that they may become one in us so that our actions and behaviors perfectly match our thinking and perceiving. This is what we call authenticity. When someone is behaving differently than who they really are on the inside in order to impress people, we call that being inauthentic, right? And we naturally don't like being around inauthentic people. But on the other hand, we love being around authentic people even if they're a little bit rough around the edges or they have a lot of inner work still to do. It doesn't bother us in the slightest once we know they're just being fully who they are. We appreciate them for it and respect them for it. And we naturally trust people who are authentic because we can feel that their energy and consciousness are in alignment. But when we can tell someone's being inauthentic, we intuitively don't trust that person because we know they could be hiding all kinds of bad intentions behind that mask. Their energy is not matching their consciousness and we can feel it. This is a, a psychic ability we all possess naturally that even though we just met this person and we have no idea what their real personality is like, we can instantly tell if they're being authentic or inauthentic because we are energy and consciousness. So our soul can always feel whether someone's energy and consciousness are in harmony with each other or in conflict with each other. So hopefully now you have a new perspective on this law of attraction teaching we hear all the time, which says you do not attract what you want, you attract what you are. If we want wealth and abundance, but we feel empty or lacking or unworthy of it within ourselves, the universe will not violate the law of cause and effect to bring me abundance when I feel lacking in my state of consciousness. You are the creator of your reality. You are the cause of everything. And the effects that appear in your life are really just the extensions of who you are. So we must learn and practice mastery over our state of being. And as we've said many times in this series, mastery is that ability to be in your chosen state of consciousness in any given circumstance at will. And to cultivate this mastery, we have to learn to stop taking our cues from our circumstances because in actuality, our circumstances are taking their cues from us. The energy of the universe is constantly reading your state of consciousness. In a very real sense, the whole universe is waiting for you to decide who you want to be in this moment. And then the universe will reflect that back to you in form. And the form that appears will then strengthen your state of consciousness. And this is what drives spiritual evolution. So when we heal our karma through right action, through forgiveness, and through learning the lessons life is teaching us, we are literally taking our power back. We are retrieving our soul's energy that we extended out of us karmically. And as we gain more of that available energy back into ourself, our level of consciousness naturally rises as a result. We move closer and closer to our original soul blueprint, the Logos, 
and we become on earth as we are in heaven. In our first episode, we said that spiritual intelligence is our capacity for awareness and embodiment. And so through the law of cause and effect, we can actually approach raising our spiritual intelligence from these two angles. We can choose to continually behold our chosen state of being in mind, and that's awareness. And we can also choose to act and behave as if we are that person here and now, and that's embodiment. So if we keep the law of cause and effect at the forefront of our awareness, we will naturally raise our spiritual intelligence profoundly because we will start taking responsibility for every unconscious action and every unconscious thought, knowing that they must produce a corresponding effect in our life. So there's no more playing the victim card any longer. You become the creator here and now. When we live according to this law, we find the spiritual garden of Eden within us. Between the two rivers of energy and consciousness, and where those rivers meet within us, there's no more duality, no more difference or conflict between our energy and consciousness, no more inauthenticity. And so we naturally want to be good to everyone, to be loving, to be forgiving, and to be at peace with all that is. Because now that we are in harmony within ourselves, we experience a universe of unending harmony. Because we have realized that all our circumstances ever do is reflect our state of consciousness back to us. And so in this way, we never actually see or interact with a circumstance but only ever with ourself. So what the law of cause and effect is really saying to us is you only ever see your own state of being. <laughs>